Good morning, everyone. I have to confess I'm a little jealous today. I usually get all the attention in the room because I'm the youngest, but today I have to share it with all of you. But jokes aside, I want to thank the President of the General Assembly. We call him PGA at home. Uh, thank you for convening this important meeting to bring the youth voices to the UN and for giving me an opportunity to come to work in jeans. Um, I also want to thank all the government representatives and partners to help uh, to, who helped us put this event together, the young people who flew from afar to be with us today. Today's event will touch upon three main topics that are relevant to young people, regardless of where they're coming from, which part of the world, which religion, which ethnicity they belong to, or which sexual orientation and gender identity. These are education, employment, and violence and radicalization. When we talk about these topics, we often tend to put young people at the receiving end, as the mere beneficiaries of policies and programs designed by adults, and often underestimate young people's ability to challenge the status quo and drive social change through innovation, creativity, and commitment. We hardly recognize young people as the true partners as they are. However, in my talk today, instead of talking to you about what the United Nations does or doesn't do for young people, I want to focus on three stories. Three stories of three exceptional young people that I met on the ground in my work as the UN Secretary General's on War Young Youth. Today, half of the world's population is under the age of 25. For extremist groups, the sheer number of our generation makes us the lucrative target that can be exploited. For decades, these extremist groups have strategically targeted young people. They are deliberately trying to recruit ever younger children and young people through social media and peer-to-peer -peer networking. Yet, not every young person is the ticking bomb. A vast majority of children and young people aspire to have better lives and build a better future for themselves and the society around them, despite being repeatedly failed by our political institutions and formal structures. I had the honor of meeting one such inspiring young person last February in Senegal. And I'm very honored that he's here with us in this chamber today, and we are honored by his participation. Most people had the privilege of a great, fun childhood, but Mohamed Sidibe, unfortunately, was not one of them. Growing up in Sierra Leone during the Civil War, he has been orphaned, uneducated, and left homeless. At the age of five, Mohammed had to witness his entire family being murdered and was forced to become a child soldier. Rather than going to school and being a child, he was trained to be a soldier and was forced to kill and to be killed. At the age of 10, he was homeless and was neither able to read or write. In 2007, at the age of 14, Mohammed ran away at the JFK airport in New York in search of peace, education, and life in a community that will not judge him for his past, but rather help him achieve his future aspirations. But what's so inspiring is that he's unafraid to speak about his past, and he is committed to making sure that no young person has to endure what he had to go through as a child. Today, he stands tall and strong as a peace and human rights activist and a global education specialist from whom you will hear soon. I'm super proud to hear that he has got accepted to law college and he will be going to law school in this summer. This gives a perfect leeway for me to enter into the story of the protagonist of my second story. We all know that education is the key to prevention but also in a world of rapidly advancing digital technologies and artificial intelligence, which will impact the outlook of the future of work, we have to rethink our approaches on education and skills development. We need to equip young people, not only with technical and vocational skills, but with adaptable soft skills that will help them navigate a complex and ever-changing world of work. This requires that we 
not only look at the needs of our education system today, but also those of tomorrow, exploring questions such as what role has the informal and non-formal education has to do with preparing us to be able to face the future of work. In the age of digital revolution, in many parts of the world, digital literacy challenges are still prevalent. Despite the significant progress made in the past decades, the world is still home to some quarter billion children and young people who are missing out on school. However, according to UNESCO, 130 million girls between the ages of 6 and 17 are out of school, and 15 million girls of primary school age, half of them in sub-Saharan Africa, will never enter a classroom. To quote Malala, Education, secondary education for girls can transform communities, countries, and our world. It is an investment in economic growth, a healthier workforce, lasting peace, and the future of the planet. Her words and actions have inspired many young women to lead by example in their own communities. Peace Adobola is one of them. I met Peace at the Global Partnership for Education Conference in Dakar this year, where she represented the Malala Fund. She urged world leaders to invest in free and safe education in their countries. At that conference, donors pledged funding totaling 2.3 billion, and 53 developing country partnerships promised to increase their spending on education by a total of 110 billion. When I later visited the internally displaced people in the Varu community in Abuja, Nigeria, I had the privilege to meet her alongside other young women who she mobilized to encourage families to send their daughters to school. Peace has been seeking support in the creation of a secondary school as well as a youth center in her community to ensure that young women and men in her community gets access to education and skills development. She's also currently looking for partnerships in a campaign that provides sanitary pads to secondary school girls and promote higher standards of girls' sexual and reproductive health. Worldwide, many young women's access to education is limited by sanitary facilities in schools and educational institutions instituting taboos that confirming ideas such as they shouldn't go to school when they're on their period. As a youth advocate and student herself, peace is an inspiration in her activism and the fight for education. When young leaders like peace speak, the world listens. This is why we need to create more platforms for young people like Speaks to speak up. According to the ILO estimations, 200 million new jobs will have to be created over the next five years to keep up with the new job market entrance in the emerging and developing countries. Research shows that young people in all parts of the world expect to create more jobs than adults over the next decade. Yet, young entrepreneurs face extreme challenges to access capital to start up or grow their businesses as they are perceived at high risk due to their age and limited entrepreneurial experience. Despite these challenges, they are at the forefront of innovation and job creation. You all know about the stories of young CEOs, of tech giants and billion dollar companies, but there are countless social entrepreneurs whose business vision is to contribute to social development. Rita Kimani, one of the UN Young Leaders for Sustainable Development, is one of them. Rita co-founded FarmDrive, a platform that bridges the gap between smallholder farmers and financial institutions in Kenya. Agriculture is one of the most effective means to both social and economic development in most of Africa, as over two-thirds of the population depend on it for living. Rita's company equips farming communities with the resources they need to thrive in their farming enterprises. Through the use of mobile technology, she has managed to empower particularly young farmers in Kenya to grow their farming ventures, creating and maintaining more and more employment opportunities. 
More than 3,000 farmers are registered with Farm Drive, and loans has been facilitated to 400 farmers through Rita's business. To me, the stories of these three young people from Africa, one of the youngest continents in our world, and the youngest that will be by 2030, illustrates the true aspirations and potentials of my generation. Their work and commitment inspires me, and I know it inspires you as well. These young people come from regular or underprivileged backgrounds, but yet have transformed into leaders of their communities. They are young people whose stories should decorate the headlines of the big news channels, social media, and newspapers. We live in a world where a majority of the mainstream media appears to be on a mission to create an image of young people as a generation of careless and lazy individuals who do not, if managed properly, could turn into a threat or a burden to a country. This must be prevented by giving spotlight to people like Rita, Mohammed, Peace, Peter, and Mari, who are just a handful out of millions of young people on a mission to make this world a better place. This morning, all of us spoke about the sustainable development goals, about ending poverty, ending hunger, and reversing climate change. But if we are to realistically achieve, achieve sustainable development goals, it is our generation who is going to do this. We are the SDG generation. The rest of the world can try, but they cannot and will not make it without our generation. Thank you very much.